Today on the Dr. Osborne Zone, we're talking about home remedies if you get glutened. We'll talk about health care amnesty as well as drugs that mimic celiac disease. It's an episode you're not going to want to miss. We'll be right back. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over to Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to the Dr. Osborne zone. Today we're going to be talking about home remedies, things that you can do to overcome getting gluten exposure. We're getting ready to launch into the holidays and so it's a very commonality as you go out to eat, to parties, to families' homes. Um, and you probably partake a little bit of what we would call OPF, other people's food. Getting gluten exposure, cross-contamination is a very real risk for those of you with gluten sensitivity. So we're talking about strategies to help you overcome that. Now, any good strategy comes first with a proactive strategy, right? So what do we do first? What we want to talk about is what you can do to prevent the problem in the first place. Now, in my opinion, one of the best things that you can do is minimize eating out. And I know the temptation is going to be there for many of you, but if you minimize eating out, you'll stay away from a lot of the cross-contamination and you'll stay a lot away from the accidental gluten. But if you're going to eat out, one of the things that I would encourage you to do, and depending, just depending on where you go, I like to bring some of my own food. Um, now, if that's not an option in that regard, eat before you go out, and that way you're not having to choose as much. And this is a big one for me uh, because a lot of times I'll eat the bulk of my meal before I go out and visit with friends uh, or, or business lunch or whatever it might be in your case. Uh, but I'll eat before I go, and that way when I go, I, I don't have to worry about a huge meal. I can get something very small and sometimes nothing at all. I'll just get me something to drink and, that, uh, and then just meet with the person. So eat before you go out is definitely an option. It's one that, uh, that's very proactive. Now, bring, as far as bringing your own food goes, this is going to be more if you're visiting other people's homes. Um, and so some of you might be looking, you know, kind of frowning and thinking, there's no way, I'm, I'm not going to bring my own food. Well, this, this, this advice here kind of goes hand in hand with, with this bullet down here, which is communicate with your loved ones. And so you can't just show up at somebody's house um, with all of your own food after they've slaved away in the kitchen to prepare a meal for you and not let them know that you're gonna bring food. Like that's considered to be rude and so you wanna communicate first. And the way I like to communicate this is, hey, you know, I, I am, you know, I'm coming. Like if it's, if it's your grandma, if it's your aunt or uncle, or if it's a relative, you, you just call them up and say, look, you know how much I love your cooking and your food, but I'm on a special diet and, uh, and I have to be very diligent about it and there's just no way that I can expect you to, to accommodate for me. So I'm gonna be bringing some of my own food. I just don't want you to take offense to that, but I want, and I wanted to give you a heads up because I don't, I don't want you to try to, you know, turn over the entire kitchen to try to accommodate for my, my special need. And so in that way, you're letting them know before you go that you're gonna be bringing some things and that this way they're not offended if you don't choose to eat some of the foods. And so, again, it's important to have that communication, to have that conversation if you're traveling to somebody else's home. Otherwise, you're just being a rude guest um, and, that, and that won't fly very well either. Now, if you're eating out, Again, you can eat before you go, but you can also investigate the restaurant before you go, which is one of the issues I've seen a lot of people struggle with is when they get to the restaurant, they have no idea what the menu is, and so then they feel overwhelmed and they feel, um, in a sense, they feel like they have to pin down the waiter or the waitress to get, uh, you know, to get them to kind of walk through everything and make sure there's no gluten. So do your investigation before you go. If you do a little research about the restaurant you intend on going to, um, you can figure out what their menu is, whether or not they do offer gluten-free options. Um, you can even call ahead of time just to ask any other kinds of specific questions. And that way, when you get there, you don't have to be the one that's holding up the order for everybody else. You don't have to be the one that uh, feels like uh, everybody's eyeballs are on you because you're ordering something different or special. So again, 
investigate that restaurant's menu and maybe even potentially call them before you go. That way you can under, get a better understanding of what you can order and, and uh, maintain that sense of, of normalcy. Now, in addition, in addition to that, one of the best proactive strategies is taking Gluten Shield. Now, if you don't know what Gluten Shield is, it's a, it's a proteolytic enzyme that contains um, a, a spectrum of enzymes, many of which help to degrade gluten proteins so that if you do get cross-contamination or accidental exposure, you've got something there to catch it and help break it down to, to potentially minimize your risk. Now, um, some of you, and, and there are some companies that make enzyme products for, for people with gluten sensitivity, and they're claiming that if you use their product that you won't get any, there's, that there's zero risk of gluten exposure, and they're liars. Don't listen to that. Remember that, and even with Gluten Shield, Gluten Shield is not designed to allow you to eat gluten. It's designed to protect you from small amounts that you could get cross-contamination from. So don't think that this is a catch-all and that if you take it, you can go eat the bread rolls that are, that are laid out on the dinner table. So again, taking that proactively before you go or as you're there 10 minutes before you eat can also you know, go a long way to protecting you. But these other strategies really preventatively, if you're trying to not get gluten during the holiday season or really any time when you go out, you want to definitely make sure you get used to those and put those on your habit list. Now, one of the other you know, fundamental questions that comes up is if I do get glutened, you know, how, how, what's that process look like? So some are more sensitive than others. So one of the things I think it's also important to understand is your digestive transit time. Uh, when you're talking about getting gluten exposure, if you look at the total time that it takes for food to pass from your mouth to your anus, you know, you're looking at anywhere, depending on the person, from 39 to 52 hours. You know, if we look up, you know, further up north, we've got two and a half to three hours. Uh, it takes 50% of the, uh, two and a half to three hours for 50% of the stomach contents to be emptied and, and about five hours for the total stomach emptying. And then we have this transit time of two to three hours going through the small intestine and then another 30 to four hour, 30 to 40 hours going through the colon. So again, that, that summarizes or totals, you know, anywhere from 39 to 52 hours. And that, again, is, is, is influenced by a variety of different components. And so one of them is, is different types of food. Some food is easier digested by some than others, and you have to keep that into consideration. Stress dramatically can reduce transit time. Uh, chronic stress, those of you struggling with you know, chronic constipation issues, you've got to really keep this in mind. Your transit time might be much, much slower, so getting gluten, that gluten might stick with you and stay with you a lot longer. Of course, gender. Gender you can't change, although in today's society some would believe that you can. Um, exercise, um, exercise can definitely improve your transit time in the long haul and then hot, proper sleep and hydration as well. So these things that can influence the speed at which food traverses from your mouth to your anus. And so if you get gluten, if gluten comes in through that meal, you know, it's got to make that trek or that journey in best case scenario we're talking about this length of time. So there are different strategies if you do get gluten that we can speed up this transit time process and get it out of you. But I think it's also important to remember it's not just about getting it out of you because gluten creates an antibody response and the problem with that is if you get glutened and your immune system starts generating antibodies, the half-life of an antibody for, against gluten is two to three months. And so that, that's, that ha why is that important? It's because the antigen antibody complex that forms um, when, you get, when you get exposure to gluten, that antibody antigen complex, it takes two to three months for half of it to go away. And so in that two to three month time frame, that's inflammation that's being triggered inside of you, whether it's in your GI tract or whether it's in your systemic circulation. And so this is really, in my opinion, the most dangerous part Whereas the, the acute exposure of your GI tract lining to gluten, you know, again, we can get rid of that relatively quickly, but it's this here that is the most dangerous part. So keeping those things in mind, let's talk about the strategies to in, in, incorporate to overcome. So let's say you're, you're doing everything right, you go to a restaurant, you know, somebody goofs up, you get the wrong meal, you get the wrong food, it's highly contaminated with gluten, you get exposure. So in my experience, one of the number one things you can do 
is you can flush out your bowel. And uh, I've talked about this a lot. So if we look up here, number one is flush out the bowel. Uh, and how do we do a bowel flush? So, so this is a lot like doing a colonoscopy prep. You know, when you, when you get ready to go to the doctor to do a colonoscopy, they give you um, this drink and it's an osmotic laxative and it pulls water into your bowel and helps flush them out. Well, vitamin C can do this as well very, very effectively. And what I like about vitamin C is number one, there are really no side effects. It's not going to damage you by using vitamin C to perform a flush. Number two, vitamin C supports immune system function. And there's some research that shows that vitamin C repairs colon cell damage caused by gluten. And that's why another reason why I like vitamin C for this option. Uh, but the other thing that vitamin C does is a very powerful anti-inflammatory and it helps fuel your immune cells. So it's going to prime and fuel your immune cells and support them in that fight against the gluten antibodies. And so how do we do a vitamin C flush? It's very, very simple. You want to use a powder, ideally not pills, because if you're using pills, you're just going to stack pills up in your GI tract. And if you don't break down capsules very well, the flush isn't going to go very well for you. So pre broken down powder is the best thing to use. You also have to make sure that the vitamin C powder that you use is not a corn based vitamin C. A lot of them are. They're made out of corn and so you'd want to avoid that because again, we, you know, those of you that follow no grain, no pain, you're avoiding corn, not just wheat, barley, and rye. You're also avoiding corn. So a corn-free vitamin C powder and the way you want to do this, it's six grams mixed in three ounces of water every 15 minutes. So, so three, six grams, which, which is, is, a, is equivalent to, again, 6,000 milligrams if you're looking at the dosing, and mixed in three ounces of water. So you should take that powder, mix it in three ounces of water, stir it really well. If you're using something like Detox C, you want to make sure that fizz dies down, that effervescence dies down, otherwise you'll get really gassy as you go through this process, but stir it really well and drink it, and you're going to drink that amount every 15 minutes until your bowels start moving and flushing, uh, and then it'll run its course. And for most people, a flush like this takes anywhere from two to five hours, sometimes a little bit longer to do, and so it's a good idea if you do a flush after gluten exposure, ideally you do it at home where you're close to the bathroom, where you're not at work, right, or you're not in the car having to go somewhere because you will need the bathroom, and when you need it, you'll need it fast. So again, this will help flush the bowel out, in essence, by flushing that bowel out. Anything that's in you that you ate, it, you know, it accelerates that 39 to 52 hour transit time and gets it right out of you and you know, potentially reduces the immune system's interaction with that gluten. And so again, one of the best things that you can do immediately after. Okay, now the other thing that, that you can do, let's say you, you night before you, you went out and you got glutened you, and maybe you want to do a flush, but then after the flush is over, consider fasting for a longer period of time. And so what I have seen be effective for people is 24 hour plus fast. Why do we do that? Because after you cleanse out the bout, you want to give it time to heal and repair and rest. And so when you get into that fast, uh, once you get to that 24-hour mark, you're going to actually create apoptosis, which is the cells that are damaged are going are, are to basically kill themselves, commit suicide, so that new cells can be made, new fresh cells that aren't damaged. And so you consider that fast as a quicker way to stimulate healing and repair. It can be very, very effective. And so I've seen people do very easily, you know, again, this, it's different if you're diabetic. So again, if you're diabetic, you have major blood sugar problems, this may not be the right strategy for you. But if you aren't, this can be a fantastic strategy, but anywhere from, from a one day to a three day, up to three days. But one day, in my experience, is generally enough to really help a person overcome a good gluten exposure. The other things that we do on the flip side of that is we support the microbiome by, by using probiotics. One of the things that happens when you get gluten, and this has been shown in research studies, is gluten affects certain types of bacteria. And some researchers believe that it's because 
gluten's impact on the microbiome is, is one of the reasons why so many people have different types of side effects. And so you can help rebalance the microbiome with several different strategies. Number one, take a good quality probiotic. I recommend Biotic Defense or Ultrabiotic Defense in this case. Um, it was actually designed for people trying to come off of gluten. It was designed, the species were picked for that. The, the different types of probiotic species were picked specifically for that. But the other thing that you can do is introduce, after your fast is over, is introduce highly qual high quality fermented foods that are rich in different and diverse bacteria. And so one of, the, one of my favorites is sauerkraut, which is a fermented cabbage. And I'm really a bigger fan of the fermented vegetables versus say fermented dairy products, just because so many people with gluten issues or gluten reactivity have problems with dairy and don't do well with dairy either. So, you know, I wouldn't in this situation use something like yogurt. I'd more specifically use something like fermented sauerkraut or fermented cabbage, fermented carrots, fermented cauliflower those types of things. Again, the vegetables can be very effective, fermented vegetables. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and I, you know, this you should be doing, your, if you have the opportunity to do it, you should be doing anyway, uh, and that's getting your hands dirty, getting your hands in the dirt, in the soil. If you have a garden, this is perfect. They've, their researchers uh, are now studying the microbiomes of people that own gardens and that are in their gardens getting their hands in the dirt on a frequent basis. And what they're finding is those individuals have far more robust and diverse microbiomes. And that gives you a level up, that gives you an edge of resiliency as it comes to being glutened in the first place because a healthy microbiome will support you if you do get glutened. So you want to go into, again, the the opportunity or possible potential being gluten, you'd like to go into that scenario with an already robust microbiome that can help you and help defend you. And then as I mentioned earlier, support and digestion. And this is um, when you damage your GI tract and it's, you know, after you've been glutened, that, that GI tract is damaged. There's inflammation that can occur. And so supporting your body with digestive enzymes after the fact can be helpful. And, and, and so again, especially a, a gluten busting enzyme that can be helpful to bust down to break down the gluten but also a broad spectrum digestive enzyme because that can be helpful if the gluten has damaged your your intestines again it's affecting your digestion moving forward it can be helpful for you to start breaking your food down a little bit better so you can get better nourishment out of the next few meals so supporting that digestion uh, is very, very key. And so it's not even just digestive enzymes here. This could also be using acid, um, like for example, betaine hydrochloride. We have, we have something at Gluten-Free Society called ultra acid, which can be helpful in this situation. Uh, but also, if you don't have a gallbladder, you know, you might consider bile acid as a supplemental as well and that's digestion support. So again, you've got multiple different options here. You, you know, acid to support the stomach, bile acid to support the gallbladder, the liver, and then digestive enzymes to support the digestion and breakdown of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins within the GI tract after the gut gets damaged. Uh, we also know that adequate sleep becomes a very, very important part of the healing process. And so what happens when you get glutened is that will activate the sympathetic nervous system, which is what it's also sometimes referred to as fight or flight. And you don't want the sympathetic nervous system in, in, in full mode activation when you're damaged. Your body, you know, ideally wants to activate parasympathetic, and that's part of how we heal, repair, sleep, and digest better. So again, gluten can activate that sympathetic. And so if you do get gluten, one of the best things you can do too uh, you know, again, with all these strategies, is just make sure you go to bed and get a good night's sleep and let your body heal and repair and rest. And hopefully with this, remember, sleeping resets the circadian rhythm and it sets you up for the next morning for a really healthy poop, right? Because ultimately we want to eliminate the gluten. We want to get it out of us as quickly as possible. So if you're not following this flushing strategy, Again, and you, maybe you're doing some of these other things, you do want to make sure it comes out of you because, it, you know, some people gluten constipates. And I have had people that have come to see me where they get glutened and they're constipated for the next three or four days. They don't have a bowel movement and that gluten just stays in their intestine. And they're not, because they're not having a bowel movement, it's just, it's just creating and wreaking more and more havoc. So again, this goes back to, 
you know, get a poop out of you, you know, have a bowel movement as quickly as you can after being gluten. So that's going to help ensure that you're flushing out uh, whatever exposure that you got to minimize the potential for that damage to occur. Okay, and then the last strategy here is to get educated. You know, so many people, um, you know, they, they, they know they should be gluten-free, but they're not quite sure how to go, you know, gluten-free as, as far as the diet's concerned, and they're not even really sure what gluten is. Um, you know, the, most of the world looks at gluten as wheat, barley, and rye, but the vast majority of, of people uh, continue to eat other grains that contain other forms of gluten that can do damage, those grains like corn and rice and even oat. And so get educated and know what gluten is. And one of the things, we'll put a link down below to the master class. If you haven't taken it, it's absolutely free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's called the Glutenology Master Class. And it's a five-day class, you know, walking you through everything you should know about not only going gluten-free, not only, you know, how to go gluten-free, but the symptoms of gluten exposure. We also talk about how to navigate social situations in depth. We talk about gluten-free alcohols. We talk about um, the habits that you need to start manifesting to make sure that you don't get gluten exposure, how to find hidden gluten and cross-contamination, foods that mimic gluten, drugs that emulate or, or also can contribute to gluten-like damage. So the class is very robust, and so if you haven't taken it, make sure you get signed up for that because one of the best forms of prevention is an education. Get yourself prepared by knowing what you should be doing preventatively as opposed to being reactive in the moment. Now we're all going to get a time where we do get glutened and we have to be reactive, but we can reduce those frequencies by understanding and knowing what to do before time. So that's it. If you get gluten, we'll back up, you flush out the bowel, you fast, you support the microbiome, possibly with good probiotic. You support digestion with enzymes and acids. And you get plenty of sleep so you can have a healthy bowel movement, get that bowel moving in the morning, and you educate yourself. And if you stick to those habits, you will not have a problem with gluten in your future, and it'll be a breeze. So hope that's helpful for you. We'll see you in the next segment. Right today we're going to be reviewing Lovebird. This is a company that um, makes a grain-free cereal line. Grain-free is why we picked it to review it. And uh, this one is a grain-free with a cinnamon kind of hint or cinnamon flavor. And so let's check out you know check out the ingredients. They're all actually listed right here on the front of the box. Um, and everything is organic. So cassava, coconut, honey coconut sugar, cinnamon, coconut oil, and sea salt. So simple list of ingredients, all real food. That's a plus. It's obviously gluten-free. Let's dive into the box. Okay. Now, if you miss that morning cereal, um, as many of you do that are on a gluten-free diet, let's, let's, uh, this may, may be it. So they come out in little O shapes, if you can see that. Um, almost like a little Cheerio uh, wrapped in cinnamon. Now, I'm not going to put any milk on this because I just want to taste the cereal, plus I don't really do milk. Um, but here we go. We're going to give this one a try. Not bad, not fantastic. It's, um, you know, with cereal, sometimes you gotta take a second or a third bite and really let it, let it kick in. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna, give it a, we're gonna give it a shot here. We're gonna take another one. Yeah, still not bad. Second bite's a little bit better. Maybe, maybe you take a third or a fourth and you get better. It's not soured or, or not sour. It's not coated in milk, and so there's nothing to break it down except for, you know, my my uh, my saliva and teeth. But flavor is a little different. It's a little off for me. It's it's not that it's bad. 
Um, it's just um, not what I expected for a cinnamon cereal. I expected a lot more cinnamon to pull through and I didn't really get that. So from a taste perspective, you know, I give it, I give it if it were rating it on a 10 scale, I'd probably give it like a six. Um, on a texture perspective, just like texture of cereal. So if you like that type of texture, it's what, what I would have expected from cereal, from an O-shaped cereal. Um, but from an ingredient perspective, I'd give it a 10 stars. This is definitely organic. It's definitely grain free. Maybe it's better when you soak it in some milk or some, you know, whether it's regular milk or almond milk or whatever you do. Although it's if you're gluten sensitive, be cautious of regular milk. A lot of that cross reactivity from the casein in milk can occur. But um, again, overall quality of the product is good. You know, I would, I would maybe go back to not go back to formula, but just I would experiment with the formula. I might even, if I really wanted to get that cinnamon flavor, add some of my own cinnamon to it, because that just didn't come through very well for me. But again, overall, solid ingredients. So if you're looking to try something new, check out Lovebird's Cinnamon Cereal O's. So this week, we talk about pharma harm. I want to talk about medicines that can either cause villus atrophy or can prevent villus atrophy from healing. So those of you who don't know, villus atrophy is the hallmark symptom in those with gluten sensitivity where they have celiac disease. Celiac disease is defined as villus atrophy of the small intestine. And the problem with villus atrophy is it causes erosion of the lining of the GI tract, leading to malabsorption and uh, severe diseases and comorbidities associated with that malabsorption. And so traditionally, a gluten-free diet would help to resolve that villus atrophy. But as many research studies show, and some show as high as 92% of people following a gluten-free diet fail to achieve a remission of damage in their GI tract, and there are a number of reasons why, but one of them has to do with the use of certain kinds of medications. So I'm gonna put on the screen here for you, this is a research paper published in the International Journal of Celiac Disease. It's called Drug-Induced Sprue-Like Intestinal Disease. And so, again, quoting from the abstract of this study, many medications may cause a sprue-like small intestinal mucosal inflammatory process. And going on to list them, alcohol. I know that sounds a little crazy, and many of you drink, and this could be one of the reasons if you're still struggling. Again, alcohol can be an, a hindrance to recovery. So number one, alcohol. Number two, antibiotics. Number three, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and naproxen. We also have chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, so if you've gone through chemotherapy, these are drugs that can cause damage to the GI tract. And one of the most common ones that, that, that we see beyond even cancer are, is the drug methotrexate, which is used to treat rheumatological autoimmune arthritis. So if you've had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, or ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis, the doctors oftentimes will prescribe the drug methotrexate. Again, it's one of those drugs that we know can cause villus atrophy. Also, immunosuppressive medications like azathioprine, uh, all, again, all of these can cause mucosal changes to the GI tract. And then there's also a number of new drugs that have also been recently recognized to cause sprue-like intestinal disease. And I've talked about these before, but these include pharmaceuticals such as Olmosartan. Olmosartan is a drug used to treat high blood pressure. It's also sometimes referred to as an angiotensin receptor blocker, but Olmosartan and many other blood pressure medications that end in A-R-T-A-N, those are part of that A-R-B or angiotensin receptor blocker class, but also certain biologics that are designed to, to treat immunological diseases by suppressing the immune system. So if you're on any of these medications, but you've also been diagnosed with gluten sensitivity uh, or related diseases like celiac disease, you want to make yourself aware because if you're failing to show recovery when you follow up with your GI doctor and your, your damage to your intestinal tract is not going away, it, it's very likely or possible that these classes of medications might be playing a role. Now, I wanna show you another study. If we put this up on the screen for you, you can see here a significant proportion of celiac disease patients do not heal their small bowel mucosa despite attempts of gluten avoidance. 
They go on to say that persistent villus atrophy has been associated with serious sequelae, including lymphoproliferative malignancy, in essence, cancer, as well as osteoporotic, fra osteoporotic fractures as a result of bone loss. But in this research study, again, I'll show you on the screen, what they found, what these authors found, is that villus atrophy was associated with drugs such as PPIs, which are proton pump inhibitors commonly prescribed for as an antacid treatment, but also anti-inflammatory drugs, again, just like the other study I showed you, as well as different antidepressant medications uh, classified as SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So again, if you're on any of these different classes of medications, what research is showing is that persistent villus atrophy may be in the cards for you. And if that's the case, the sequelae of that can be severe malnutrition associated with lymph uh, lymphocytic cancers as well as bone loss. So you wanna be aware of that so you can have that conversation with your doctor. Again, if you're on any of these prescription medications, the takeaway is have a conversation with your doctor about what your risks are and what you can do to make sure that you're preventing those risks from becoming a part of your reality. Amnesty. Is amnesty something we should actually be considering for the politicians, bureaucrats, and leaders in how they handled the COVID situation? Now, a new article recently published in The Atlantic is calling for that very thing, amnesty. I've got a few things to say about amnesty. So the policies that were implemented, masking people, shutting down businesses, promoting unproven testing technologies to enrich laboratory companies worldwide, canceling schools, social distancing as a totally made up strategy, blacklisting doctors and experts who had differing opinions, including myself, firing workers for not being vaccinated after they had already worked through the entire pandemic, withholding care and blackmailing patients who weren't vaccinated, and in vaccines not even being able to stop the spread of disease or transmission. This is the policy we were handed. We were told to wash our hands and not go near anyone. We were told to socially isolate, and we were told, we were told to muzzle our kids and muzzle ourselves, and God forbid we speak up about it, or now we're murderers. And half the country went right along with it without questioning the narrative, without questioning anything, and they actually helped enforce these insane policies against their very neighbors, their family members, and friends. Now, I like to say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, the elderly were locked up, left to die in nursing homes. They couldn't even visit their families. Their families couldn't visit them for fear of COVID, yet these people, some of them were in hospice, so dying alone. Suicide is up. Drug use is up. Depression is up. Death rates in the 18 to 44 year olds from heart disease. God forbid we talk about why that death rate is up, but it's up. Children lost two years of their life and their education. Inflation is up. Businesses were permanently closed and families' lives and, and finances were destroyed. And all of this, again, for the sake of safety. Our freedoms were taken. Our ability to make decisions autonomously for ourselves were taken. We were treated like children and told to shut up and quit talking. And if you voice an opinion that's different from the mainstream narrative, we, we were basically ostracized, called out. Many doctors had their licenses taken away from them or suspended. Many people were deplatformed. Even the president of the United States was deplatformed. This is the level of censorship that we all had to put up with. And now we're being asked to just completely forgive and forget and move on and don't look in the past and don't learn from the past. And God forbid you look at the people who are in charge in making these decisions and hold them accountable for, for what actually happened. 
Now to me, if you're gonna choose to be a leader and you're gonna be in public service, what you're choosing is accountability. And if you can't stand up and take ownership over the incorrect actions that you took on a broad scale that were damaging and damning to a large part of our population, you don't belong in the game of public service. You need to be able to have tough skin if you're in that arena. And so I think it's time that we don't look at amnesty as the next possibility, but we look at accountability so that these mistakes are not repeated the next time something happens in this country. We completely ignored things that make the most sense. You know, if we look at COVID deaths, one, they were exaggerated and overblated, but if we actually look at who died, they were people with diabetes and obesity and pre-existing heart disease. So if we really want to stop pandemics from happening in our future, we have to back up and take a proactive stance around health and nutrition. And we have to have policymakers and we have to have leaders in place who understand those things and can help us implement those things so we don't get into the bind in the future. Who do we need to hold accountable? You know, let's look at the top because as the old adage goes, you know, poop rolls, rolls downhill, but we should start with poop going uphill in this case. Fauci, Dr. Burks, Dr. Walensky of the CDC, the CDC itself, the FDA, the uh, HHS, the state and local governments who got behind the lockdowns and the school shutdowns and used their police force to enforce things that were not legal to be enforced. All of these individuals need to be accountable. How do we hold them accountable? Well, one, you can get out and vote. But two, you should all be communicating with them. You should all be reaching out to them because in the next coming years, if we don't do something about what happened to us in the past, we're going to be victims of the same rhetoric, victims of the same censorship, and victims of the same damning policies that almost destroyed our country. Yeah, news is, um, it's a funny business, isn't it? Because if you, you, you watch the news here, you, you, it's so propagandized and it's so, there's, it's so clear that there's a, an underlying agenda being pushed. And uh, so I don't watch news at all. If we're talking about you know, mainstream media, don't watch CBS, ABC, NBC, Fox, don't watch MSNBC, don't watch CNN, none of them, because they're all propagandized platforms. So if I really want to get good news, I like to look at other countries' news. So like Russian TV, they have a different perspective on what happens in America. And a lot of times there's not that same agenda where they're trying to hide things from you. Um, Australia has a good news channel. Um, uh, even watch some of the Great Britain news channels. And, and although they're a little bit propagandized too, I feel like we get better American news by watching other countries news reports on us and then beyond that um, I really don't care much for the news as a whole anyway because most of what's going on in the world globally is not going to impact me or you in any tangible way in which you can change the outcome all you can really do every day is is um, show up for yourself show up for your wife or husband show up for your family and show up in a big way and try to improve the world. And I think that's the best news, right? Is that you don't have to watch that nonsense and get depressed by all the fear porn that's being pushed. You can just show up in your own life every day and do great things. And uh, you know, small things are great things. You know, spend time, spending time with a child can be a great thing if that child is being shaped and molded by you. Um, you know, spending time with your spouse could have a great outcome. There are just so many things that you can do in your day to day. I love coming here and being with you, uh, and just helping you understand how to change your diet and your lifestyle so that you can make your health better. And again, when we all do that, when we all show up for each other every day and turn off the negativity and we make this world a much better place. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this, and make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.
One of our flagship products, Gluten Shield, was designed to support people on their gluten-free journey. It's especially beneficial for those just learning about their gluten sensitivity. There's an average 12-week learning curve in that. It was designed to protect from accidental gluten exposure and cross-contamination, as well as to support and protect you during travel or eating out. It was not designed to help you eat more gluten. That's a key. Now, Gluten Shield key ingredients include proteolytic enzymes and something called DPP-4. Now, this enzyme's been shown to break down the proline and glutamine bonds in gluten proteins. It also contains a proteolytic enzyme blend designed to help you break down proteins. Remember, years of gluten-induced intestinal and stomach damage can sometimes inhibit that process. It contains carbohydrate-busting enzymes that support the digestion of the starchy components of grains. And it contains a very specialized probiotic called Bifidobacterium infantis. Bifidobacterium infantis is a specialized probiotic strain that has been shown in research studies to aid in the breakdown of difficult to digest carbohydrate elements found in grains. It's also been shown with celiacs to reduce intestinal symptoms. It also helps support overall digestion. Now, Gluten Shield also contains an herbal blend for additional digestive support. It contains fennel which aids in digestion and supports relaxation of the smooth muscle lining the GI tract. Contains ginger, traditionally used for nausea and upset stomach. It's also believed to promote digestion by increasing the flow of saliva, gastric juices, and bile. It also contains peppermint, used to support digestion and to provide relief from GI discomfort. Now, recommended use for Gluten Shield, if you're taking it for daily maintenance, just take one capsule with each meal or snack for supporting digestion and daily gluten protection. For enhanced performance, take two capsules with each meal or snack for travel or eating out. Now, if you want it for aggressive use, take three capsules with each meal or snack. This is best for gluten-free newbies, those who are new to the gluten-free diet and not quite sure whether they're avoiding all of the gluten in their environment.